Welcome to Trash Arts Take. It's uh, Sam and Jackson, and today we're going to be talking about Giallo films. Now, Giallo films have always interested me, but I don't know enough, so we thought we'd do a sort of introduction to Giallo films. And joining us to talk about this is Michael Fausti and Darren Ward. How are you? How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're good, mate. How are you? Yeah, good. Very, very well. So very well. Everyone having a good December then, with uh, the looming Christmas coming. Yeah. So, like, we start at the beginning with Giallo films. Now, now, um, the first Giallo film was The Girl Who Knew Too Much by Maria Bava, uh, Bava which you guys can pronounce correctly, hopefully. Um, what, what, what are the rules of Giallo? Like, let's say, uh, so if, um, I don't know, who wants to start? What, what would you say are the rules? Because to me, from what I've seen, there's definitely some rules to making Giallo films. Um, well, I'll, 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 I'll say a quick bit. Obviously, uh, the black glove killer uh, up revealed to the last, you know, uh, the last few frames. Um, grandiose murder set pieces. Um, primary colours blasting out from every direction, and uh, a lot of cool POV, a lot of cool uh, uh, camera work uh, and music. I mean, the whole package is really. Uh, um, just so vibrant. Yeah, I, I, I'd echo that. I mean, uh, sort of, you know, as Darren said, the sort of thing that everybody sort of springs to mind with whenever you mention Jallo is is those black leather gloves that sort of first start to make an appearance. I think in um, the girl who knew too much, but really sort of become, um, you know, much more sort of pronounced in in Blood and Black Lace, where they are sort of lingered on, and and I think there you see the the costume in Blood and Black Lace of the uh, the sort of the black trench coat and the black hat. Um, I mean, also just to sort of add a couple of things, um, you know, often the, the sort of plot with these movies is never entirely straightforward. Many of them are kind of uh, borrowing from um, sort of Agatha Christie novels. In particular, uh, there was one called And Then There Were None and in which you have a kind of succession of people who are killed and you've got to try and work out who the killer is and it's always the last person you thought it would be and i think that's a, a kind of sort of staple of the plot that you know try and focus on the person who's least likely to be the killer and you're probably pretty close to uh, being who you know being close to who actually the killer is in terms of the narrative um the girl who knew too much also introduces one of the other kind of i guess sort of economic imperatives of the Jello, which is they always try to have at least one American or relatively well-known actor amongst the cast who, who probably wasn't an Italian. So yeah. in The Girl Who Knew Too Much, you have sort of John Saxon, and then in other movies, you know, you, you get people like sort of George Lazenby and various other kind of sort of like, um, you know, sort of B-movie or relatively well-known actors pop up. So... Um just to jump on to one of those films you mentioned there, and one that we actually watched a couple of days ago, Blood and Black Lace, which I thought was absolutely stunning. Like, yeah, some of those set pieces, they're just so colourful. And yeah, when, yeah, sorry, you, when you were saying about the killer and the way they were, like, I, I don't know, it was like a surprising new thing I'd not seen in a film where you're thinking, oh, who's the killer, who's the killer? And then once you realise who it is, you're now with them. And you're like, oh, the detectives were kind of pointless. Yeah. They weren't even the thing that was pushing the narrative yeah. forwards. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Blood and Black Lace is also really a stylistic blueprint that many of the other directors are, Jan, say, Sergio Martino, uh, Alberto Lenzi, sort of, you know, all sort of plundered bits from, you know, in, in terms of its stylistic approach. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very influential movie uh, right now. Sorry, your line's quite weak, Darren, so it's just like interpreting oh, and then... Sorry, I, was just saying, I was just saying that... Uh, was that any better? That's a little bit louder, yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was just saying really that um, Black Black Lace is really you know, stylistic blueprint. Um, many of the other directors that went on to make uh, substantial amounts of Giardia. Uh, Gento, Sergio Martino, Alberto Lenin. You know, it's, it's the movie where uh, that gave you the pop in colours and there's everybody's talking about um, you know, the black hat, the trench coat, the black hat, black gloves. So it's, it's very, that should be, uh
Yeah, the score is stunning. Absolutely stunning. It's um, it's something that seems to be noticeable in a lot of Giallo films. From the ones that like I picked up on watching, is the music. It it builds the whole entire atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I think that's always worth sort of like mentioning is, you know, I mean, we'll come on to Argento in a minute, but certainly Blood and Black Lace sort of um, introduces this kind of prowling camera that that you get in sort of later jallos mm. and you know the camera just almost sort of seems to be an additional character and at points you are sharing as as Darren sort of said the the POV of the killer and the camera sort of tends to really sort of linger over you know these murders and they're always highly stylized yeah. and The villain is always somebody who's got these kind of sort of sadistic tendencies. You know, it's not just enough to kind of off somebody in these movies. You know, you really have to come up with uh, quite sadistic um, sort of means of doing it, which are then kind of sort of, you know, photographed in sort of glorious close up. And um, I mean, something that sort of Gento said um, is that when he was coming up with kind of sort of various kills for the Jello movies that he made, he wanted kind of kills which people would feel. You know, most people are never really going to know what it's like to be, you know, shot by a gun, but we all know what it's like to kind of, you know, chip your tooth or something like that. So you do get these kind of, um, I suppose, sort of quite graphic murders, which uh, are highly sort of like fetishized in a way that they're actually filmed. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In regards to the violence, like, I don't know if you guys know this answer, it might be just me overlooking, like, you know the other elements of film but when it comes to the 60s and stuff violence just started to emerge as being what you actually saw on screen it, things like night of living dead in american cinema i was just wondering as they're quite like political reasoning as to why you see the violence same with the exploitation films do you feel that the giallos followed that mold because obviously italians it's, italy's had quite you know fascist dictatorship and quite uh you know you can definitely say that, Sam, and also, you know, prior to many of the other uh, genres, uh, the Italians, uh, the, the Euro Prime movie, as well, is that, you know, they started at a point when everyone, that they then subsequently outdid each other, got more outlandish, and the same with the Giallo, I mean, there's a really, you know, nasty one down there, and the Giallo in Venice, by Mario Landi, and stuff, and it was more about, um, <laughs> just, you know, uh, Watch the violence, uh, you know, the most of the things like that takes place on a boat, I remember right. Uh, but, you know, um, so yeah, basically, you can also, you know, read the interview with Robert Bazzalenti, Sergio Martino, you don't go and watch each other's movies, and like, like we do now, it's like, ah, oh, that was great, that is why I went a bit further, if I did this, if I did that. So, is it been like the, the Italian Western, you know? That's true. So, uh, Dollars. By the time the Italian Western really has gone now in the late 70s, you know, they've they done 600 plus. It was just entire genre that there was nothing left to be able to give. The kind of, that kind of really happened with the, the, the Giada Ultimate as well. So I guess we're getting a bit of that. Yeah, <laughs> off tangent a bit, but there you go. I mean, I just, I guess, sort of echo what sort of Darren's saying in that ultimately, you know, as, as with all of these kind of sort of genres you know there is a kind of cycle which that they kind of all sort of enter into and they start to sort of borrow sort of elements from each other so mm. you know it, you can sort of see a, a sort of line of trajectory from sort of like blood and black lace to um dario argento's bird with a crystal plumage in the you know the the, the killer i mean he's, he's costumed in almost exactly the same sort of like um you know garb mm. Um, and again, there is a real kind of focusing with Argento's um, sort of first proper Jallo, the bird with the crystal plumage. You know, we suddenly now go into extreme close-ups on these kind of um, on these costumes, and um, there's a real orchestration to the murders when we do see them. And you know, Argento clearly looked at Blood and Black Lace and sort of thought, "Wow, I love these set pieces. I, I, I've got to outdo them." And he literally, I think, sort of sat down and almost kind of came up with the murders first, and then decided on a kind of plot to fit around them. Um, I mean, you know, since we're talking about, you know, sort of bird with a crystal plumage. I mean, it's it kind of, you know, then I think after that there are developments that occur within the genre, but almost by that point, you you've got the kind of blueprint there, and whilst you know, sort of 
other elements are introduced and you know notably a, a kind of sort of um i guess a sort of psychosexual element with some of the later um, sort of like jallos really you know the idea of, of kind of you know of, of what will become the sort of jallo is kind of you know clarified by the bird with a crystal plumage including um one of the kind of sort of favorites which is that the um the main character is normally an outsider um invariably somebody who is not a native to the city in the case of the bird with a crystal plumage you know they're they're an outsider they're not actually kind of from that part of the world and the sort of like standard plot normally for sort of like the male sort of characters is they they witness a murder and then the rest of the movie is them trying to kind of, you know, sort of either solve that murder or by witnessing that murder, they then become the kind of like target of the killer. In um, Mario Barber's first movie, you know, the, the female sort of lead witnesses a murder and then has to convince everybody that she has in fact witnessed the murder. Um, but as I say, sort of Argento with Bird of the Crystal Plumage, sort of essentially, you know, he's he's kind of drawn up the laundry list of what then becomes essentially the kind of conventions of the genre. How much do you think um, of uh, Giallo is inspired by like Hitchcock's work? Because I always see Hitchcock's name thrown around with Giallo. Um, massively, I think. I mean, sort of Mario Barber's sort of first film, The Girl Who Knew Too Much, is obviously a nod to um, Alfred Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too mm. Much. And it's sort of Barber was very influenced by Hitchcock um, to the point in which he himself decided he was going to do a kind of cameo in that film, The Girl Who Knew Too Much. And it's actually his eyes that are, you know, looking through a painting at one point. And um, Argento the same. He decided that he wanted his hands. Hands are focused on a lot in um, Jello because often they're sort of one of the key sort of murder weapons. And it's actually Argento's hands in a lot of these movies that is actually doing the killing, as indeed it was sort of Hitchcock's hands in um, in the shower scene in Psycho. And I think a lot of these Italian directors sort of like Psycho in particular. I think was the one in which they kind of sort of thought, wow. You know, we need to go and make one of those, and this was this was a sort of like a sort of classic thing with Italian movies. The Italian audiences saw an American product, and immediately, you know, um, the sort of Italian studios and producers jumped on it and went and produced the kind of Italian version of it. See, see, with Italian films, like they always to me seems like there's um, two type Italian films before Giallo Spaghetti West, not Giallo. Two types of Italian films before um, yeah Giallo and Spaghetti Westerns. There's the, the colourful, big, you know, almost operatic with Fellini's work. And then you get, like, the neo-realist kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's interesting how Giallo takes from those more colourful aspects, but still leans quite heavily on the violence. Like you said, um, Argento wanted you to, to feel that violence. Yeah, I don't know if Darren wants to come in at this point. Yeah, oh, yeah so I've been trying to sort out my lips. <laughs> Four times while you've been talking there. Sorry, guys. Sorry, Phil. Is it any clearer, though? You're coming for a bit clearer. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry about this. Um, yeah, so, uh, where, where, where are we? Uh, we were just talking about, like, um, what Giallo takes from previous Italian cinema. So, in the sense, with neo realism and, um, you know, the Fellini picks. Well, the Italians have always made violence uh, beautiful in any sort of genre of blue, so I think they, they've got it down. Yeah, the, um, the Italians have really got an art of the violence. I mean, like, the Italian westerns and the, the, the Euro movies and the Giallo's. Um, yeah, I think it's some, but well, let's not forget, um, you know, I mean, Michael mentioned that uh, you know, the Italian audience is seen as being American. And then they can run them and take them this and then that and make it all right. But these guys didn't have nowhere near, sorry if you're really going this, no, they had nowhere near the budgets of their own. Ah, so what yeah. they meant up for that was everything was thrown on the screen. And it's a different I mean, they had great technical guys that worked on the big American, like Ben Hur and Jim Hampshire and all these other movies. Yeah, I mean, making a pocket change, really. But what you actually got 
from it was was something that blew something that was you know billions of dollars straight out the water that's my take on it that's my what i call love for the whole carrier because you know what they do with their budgets or what you get on the screen just you know it it never ceases to amaze me I think that's the thing you're right. Like when when it comes to um, comparing them with Americans and stuff, it is always one of those things where you don't have much money, you have to be a bit have a bit of ingenuity, ingenuity. and obviously with violence, it's an it's it's a you, you can always discuss a lot with it, but yeah, you can explore a lot with it as well. Yeah, you know, and, and, and it's like why not? It's, it's, you know, the European, you know, the European or liberal, so you know, it's just back in the sixties, you know, and seventies, very splash and. A lot more liberally than, than you know, say in the UK and the rest of the world. Like, you know, yeah, it's, it's just an Italian art form. So I think that's been quite elsewhere. I think, but it's quite, you know, it's great. The right violence is an Italian art. No, no, I, I think it's a great sentiment. If people couldn't hear that, that was violence is an Italian art. Am I quoting that correctly? You, you are indeed. Yeah. Now you're loud. <laughs> Yeah, you yo-yo all the time. It's an interesting experience. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry, guys. The phone hasn't moved. It's right at the back of an inch from my mouth. It's just it's a signal here. It's terrible. Um, I'll come down to you next time, uh, Sam. You're only down in Portsmouth. Yeah, that, yeah that, that would be a good idea, actually. Um, let's, let's move on to um, Dario Argento's Deep Red, which is a film that, like, yeah. I, I knew there was a twist at the end. and I knew it was going to be something... And it was a big surprise, but like before that, just the dynamicness of um, Argento's directing is really one. It's like a cocky, self-assured direction. Some of the shots, you're just like, "Wow, this is this is stunning," and just the yeah. movements, and of course, Goblin's score. It's yeah, I just thought it was near enough perfect. Yeah, it's an absolute classic. It is the classic of the genre. You know, 1975. So what, 11 years after Double Back Race, I think you know, Dario finally made the Giallo his own. saying that score by Goblin is just, you know, incredible. Yeah. And, um, it's it's doing a bit more than just, um, you know, being sort of incidental or accompanying music. It, it's really kind of conveying a, a mood or a tone or a mindset. And, um, I mean, yeah, it's, you're talking about it now, you know, you immediately want to go and watch it. And it's a film <laughs> that, you know, I've, I've watched a lot and got a great deal of admiration for. And it's just, it's just one of those kind of jallos in which just everything just everything works, you know, just cinematography, um, you know, performance. And as I say, the, the sound is, is just, you know, incredible. And, and the actual kind of set pieces themselves um, are also just, just great. I mean, you've got some really kind of ingenious um, sort of means of dispatching people. Uh, I won't give away too many spoilers, but one of my sort of favourite moments, I think, in Profundo Rosso is actually one in which the producers sort of argued with Dario Argento about and said to him, look, please don't do this, it's fine, you don't really need to include this scene. And it's a murder in which um, a puppet walks into a room. And I think one of the reasons that I love sort of Jallo movies so much is actually these these moments of surrealism that are in there. Mm. And th- there is a real kind of dreamlike quality to all of these movies that, you know, as Darren was saying, you know, that they didn't have the money and they were competing with the kind of American product. And whatever an American movie is, is sort of focusing upon, it is this idea that, you know, you're having a kind of window on the world here and we're not going to kind of disrupt that in any way. But with some of these movies, um, you know, particularly some of Lucio Fulci's early sort of like, um, sort of like Jallo movies, there's one called a, a Lizard in a Woman's Skin. And there are points you're watching this movie and it's just like, well, is this a dream or isn't it a dream? And the same is true for sort of Profundo Rosso in that you, you remember it as being this very kind of bloody and quite graphic movie, which it is. But then there are also almost real moments of surrealism in it, in which you just kind of sort of think, well, why is this happening at this yeah. point? Yeah, I mean, you touched on Fulci there, Michael. I mean, you made some great journalism there. I mean, yes, 
I'm scared. I'm tortured down there. Uh, when I'm top of the hill, I mean, yeah, he did, yeah, he makes some great accidents as well. I mean, I, you know, I, I guess sort of like Fulci again. He's one of those guys that's often remembered for those those kind of sort of video nasty movies, um, like you know, New York Ripper, which is a, a still a kind of I guess. Um, it's a nasty you know, a, a, film. A, a, yeah, he comes from the cemetery, like the cemetery zombie flashes and all that. Yeah. But um, as I say, I mean, Don't Torture a Duckling, um, which sort of Darren just mentioned, uh, is a strange one because unlike most of the other sort of Jallo movies, which are often, if not kind of set in a city, then certainly in a town, so Don't Torture a Duckling is, is you know, is pretty rural. Hmm. And, um, and again, it, it's almost taken to extreme, the idea of kind of like the person you least expect is the one who's doing it. And a pretty convoluted reason for why they're doing it, but yeah. as I say, the, um, the the violence in it is 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 quite extreme. And um, you know, I think still, you know, however many years on that we are, sort of thirty years on, it's still a movie like you know many of these other jellos that really packs a punch when you see it. Especially the scene of the hacker getting uh, yes, trying to whip the the chains and stuff, and then jumps the pipes with the. Uh, So if we were to like look at the, let's say the American counterpart, and I'm kind of curious, because obviously Giallo films didn't continue throughout Italian cinema. In the 80s, slashers became a big thing of American cinema. Do you think this had an impact on Giallo's having limitations, or was, did you feel it was just like a watered-down version? I know they have, you know, we, it has its own fans in its regard, but it does kind of heavily lift. I know Brian De Palma heavily lifts as well, but slashers really... Kind of waters it down, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean you you can really see, and and John Carpenter in Halloween actually sort of openly said that he was influenced by kind of um, Argento's movies, and I mean I think you can certainly sort of draw a line from the Italian movies to the slasher movies, but then you know, um, you know as we're about to inevitably I guess come on to sort of like many of these directors like Argento and Fulci. You know, they, they themselves moved on from the kind of Jallo to things which were sort of more, I, I guess, within the horror genre. The Jallo is, is something of a, you know, a curate's egg in that it, it's kind of often, it's, it's seen as crime, but also the violence is probably more akin to something you'd see in a horror movie. Mm, and I think that sort of, you know, after kind of Profundo Rosso, you know, the next thing Argento makes is, you know, Suspiria, you know, probably his greatest work yeah, and yeah. A, a movie in which kind of you can see that he he was heading in that direction because in the way that kind of a lot of plot elements of Profundo Rosso are you know convoluted and it's always kind of visuals in, you know in favor over plot the same with true with Fulci in that you know he kind of makes um, he makes a jello called the psychic which starts to kind of you know introduce more obvious horror elements and then by the time he gets on to the beyond you know the beyond is is one of my favorite Fulci movies but so, it's got a lot of a lot of detractors simply because you know the plot is fairly incomprehensible but i think that's actually why i like it <laughs> and the pipe dream is spotted as far why why <laughs> <laughs> 
It's funny actually because when, when I was saying to um, Darren before we started, I mentioned Suspiria and Beyond, and Darren was like, "They're not giallo." And I was like, "Okay, you're probably right. It's good we get that in early. They're just Italian yeah. horror movies. There's a difference." Yeah, I would never actually ever class those two films as, as, as giallo. You know, you could say like any director, some influences from previous work creep into you know, maybe Suspiria, The Witches. They got black gloves on as well. You know? <laughs> But, you know, it's not, it's not, you No, no, they're, they're definitely horror movies. They're, they're absolutely, absolutely. So do you see, do you see any modern giallos in your mind? Has there any been, I remember seeing a film called Am, Amber, I think. It's like a French film, which is a total homage to um, giallo films. But outside of that, you see a lot of the lighting being lifted in like Nicholas Wren films. Obviously, Michael Mann does a lot of lighting. But as far as those key yeah. rules... The only film I've actually yeah. seen that did it was a guy called uh, Stephen Sibley who did um, Ruby Rain and he stuck right to the rules and that's only like the it's a very you'd think you'd see more of it basically more, more riffs on Giallo I, I, Yeah, I mean you could say I think Michael touched on that earlier like, you know uh, Brian De Palma's style you know he's got that sort of you know Argento Accused each other of stealing ideas off each other in you know, <laughs> movies, but I mean, especially with like uh, Blowout and Body Double. Yeah. Uh, even some of the Palmer's late movies, like Sam Tower, Ron Slam, early 2000s. Uh, yeah, very, you know, you can see that uh, a lot of influences on the Italian uh, Giano and Vietnam, uh, but as for, I mean, personally, the last sort of like, I guess real Giallo I, I saw it was a year over in Weekend Affair in Germany in 2019 I, uh, I watched a movie called uh, Abracadabra oh. uh, that was made in uh, 2018 and you know that, that, that was a very traditional homage to Giallo uh, and I think it is, it is released you, you can you sort of can't track it now but you know, think about, yeah Abracadabra but not really I mean, no, I mean, I just kind of echo what sort of Darren's saying, really, in that, I mean, I think, you know, yeah, sort of, you know, within sort of Brian De Palma's work, particularly stuff like Dress to Kill, you can see, yeah, very clearly the influence of Jallo. But those movies which which have used Jallo elements have done that, that kind of thing, which I always find vaguely annoying, that it's an homage to Jallo. It's kind mm. of like, no, just make a movie. But I think that's kind of where we are. Um, I mean, one I do like, actually, is by Peter Strickland, who's a director I really like, called um, Barbarian Sound Studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which brilliant film. Is, yeah, it's, it's a movie I like, and there's a, a pretty thinly disguised um, character within that who's clearly Dario Argento. Um, there is another one, actually, which I saw a few years back at uh, Paris Cinema Festival, which stars Vanessa Paradis, and it's called Knife Plus Heart in which she's um, involved in the sort of pornography industry in Paris in the late 70s. And um, that, that worked really well, actually. Um, but I, yeah, as Darren said, invariably, I think we just get to that point now in which people want to kind of show off their film knowledge and sort of say, oh, look, you know, I've seen some Jello movies, that's why I've done this. But I think in, in terms of a tradition, no, I mean, I think it is very much of its time and as sort of Darren was saying earlier you know they they were trying to compete with the American product and they were they were using what they had to hand and so you know as we've sort of discussed before sort of things like the the colored gels and you know some of the sort of gratuitous um, blood and violence was actually kind of born out of a you know a fairly sort of like low budget and having to kind of grab attention or get the most out of a location with with just what you had to hand I mean, you could say that, um, you know, Darren made a couple of late like, entries into uh, Nolo Fono or AKA Sleepless 2000, very good solid return for that's definitely one worth tracking down and watching. Um, and, um, you know, he's meant to be making uh, a Giallo this way, he's going to start this year, but obviously because of COVID, mm. it's uh, been put on ice, uh, black sunglasses, uh, I believe it's not. Uh, and um, it's something he wrote with uh, Frank Farini about 10, 12 years ago. And it's, uh, yeah, the script's been dusted 
down and they were due to start in September. So when that was all the next stuff happened now, I don't know, but I'm very interested to see how that turns out. Especially from a script that you know, wrote over a decade ago. Because as we know, it's going to be a little bit I don't know. He's in his 90 and still making solid movies. Um, uh, but they kind of lose a bit of the, the, the energy, the rawness, um, and you can obviously see that in a lot of directors' work. As, as they get older, they kind of chisel out. So I'm, I'm kind of with trepidation thinking, no, oh, if you're going to make it, it's not. Because you know, if he does at 80 years old, it's probably going to be maybe his last movie. And you'd want him to go out with a, a solid. No, I definitely agree. And like, I think you're right as well there with Giallo, because it was just one particular time and there hasn't been like a modern boom of it or a redis, you know, them going back to it too much, that it is like a young man's energy genre, if that makes sense. Like they had all that energy to bring that dynamicness. And it's kind of nice that it just sort of stays there as a moment to be, yeah, constantly inspired by. Good job of it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, guys. Like, I like I wanted just to give a bit more introduction to some other films and some of the filmmakers within Giallo, and I think we've had a good chat about that. And I hope that um, I hope you guys can rejoin us. Do you have any yeah, more uh, giallos you want to plug to, Michael? Um, there's um, a series that Umberto Lenzi did with um, an actress called Carol Baker, and um, you know they they again sort of you know we haven't really sort of touched on really sort of like the sort of the nature of gender in, in giallo, but they kind of occupy this kind of sort of female space, which despite its kind of um, accusations of misogyny, you know. The, there is a kind of interesting exploration of sort of female sexuality in some of these movies. And as I say, the stuff that Umberto Lenzi made with sort of Carol Baker, um, this one called So Sweet, So Perverse, another one called Paranoia, one called Eyeball. Um, these are all worth checking out. And um, I was going to say, they they really are, um, I mean, to me, you see, you know, the nature of Jello is, you know, dive in, as Darren was saying, and whilst there are some duds there, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised about the kind of strange world that you find yourself in, because it's a fairly self-contained, strange world, which doesn't feel quite real, although sort of some of what you're seeing can often be graphically real. But as I say, dive in and watch a couple of movies, because they, in some respects, it's difficult to definitively say what a Jello is, but you kind of, you know when you're in one. Yeah, and it's it's an exciting like it's, a, it's an exciting world to like dive into, and I feel more people should like reach out and discover it. So hopefully this uh, podcast has helped for that. I just want to say thank you to you guys for joining us. 
Um, this is our last podcast for the year. We're having the old uh, Christmas quiz on Tuesday from 9pm on Facebook. Hope everyone has a good rest of the year and we will see you later. Everybody say goodbye. Bye-bye. Cheers and goodbye. Cheers, guys. <laughs> Bye-bye.